Cooking with Kimberly, brought to you by RB Community Church. We love our church, we love our community, and the College of the Bible, an education ministry of RB Community Church. I love cooking, and my hope is you will too. Come join me in my kitchen, and let's have some fun cooking with me, Kimberly. Hi, welcome back. We had so many requests last time for meals for one, so today we're going to cook for one. Okay, so cooking for one. That's just as easy as taking a tenth of cooking for ten, right? Yeah, no. Not really, it depends on what you're making. So it's easy to take the meat and cut it into a smaller portion, the portion that you want. And if you're putting the spices inside the dish, okay. But if you're going to boil the meat with the spices, then how much do you take out? And how much is too much? How much is not enough? So when I cook half the amount of meat, I use the same amount of spices and the same amount of vegetables in the water. But for one pound, I don't really know. You're going to have to do some non-proportional adjustments to suit your taste. Uh, a half an egg. That bent my brain a little bit, uh, but I did figure it out basically. An, an egg equals, a, a large egg equals about a quarter of a cup. So you take an egg and you beat it, you take out two tablespoons, voila you have a half an egg. I have no idea how you're gonna do a half an egg yolk. So, uh, the other thing is that buying for one is difficult because yes, you can just take a half a cup of rice, but if you had to buy a 25 pound bag, you still have a lot of rice. The deli counter, that's your friend. The meat counter, also a very good resource for buying the amount of just exactly what you want. The bulk bins used to be a fantastic place to get your food, just the amount that you want. Uh, we don't know how that's gonna work now, so you may just have to buy the whole bag of masa harina, and it's just gonna be around for a couple of years and you're gonna make a lot of tortillas. So, how many memes on Facebook did you see about wanting to have Mexican food? I saw some really funny ones. This was one of my favorites. What is Mexican food? What is Mexican food to you? Mexican food is an entire cuisine and culture. It is so much more than the ingredients. In fact, Mexican food is listed as one of the intangible cultural heritage of humanity cuisines. There's 17 of them. And if you want to know more, you can look at the link. Okay, real quick, let's talk chilies. These are poblano chilies. And they are very, very mild. And this is what they normally make um, chili rellenos from. Then we have the serrano chili, which should not be confused with the jalapeno chili. This is the jalapeno. It's a little bit bigger and it's not as hot as this serrano pepper. This serrano chili is much hotter than this chili. You're not going to want to eat this stuffed with cheese. Then we have the famous habanero, whoops, 
Then we have the famous habanero chili, which is very, very hot. Definitely wear gloves when you cut this chili and, oh, don't touch your face or mouth. Does that sound familiar? I couldn't resist. So then we have some other Mexican ingredients that uh, are very, very popular in the cuisine. We have a tomatillo, which if you open this up, looks just like a little green tomato. And it's actually called a husk tomato, but it is actually related to a gooseberry. So a gooseberry, they're all part of the nightshade family. So basically they're all uh, eggplants, tomatoes, they're all related. Now we have two kinds of limes. We have the key lime and we have the Persian lime. And the Persian lime is normally this deep, deep green color and usually seedless. This little key lime, they're tiny and fragrant, a little bit floral. The rind is a little bit yellow and they have seeds, lots and lots of little seeds considering that the other one is seedless. They have a much thinner rind, whereas the Persian lime has a thicker rind. Hatch chilies. It turns out there actually isn't a chili called hatch chilies, but there is a little village, about 1,500 people in New Mexico called Hatch. And they have made themselves famous by having a chili festival every year where they are considered the chili capital of the world. So when John and I went there, he got me some hot chilies. Onions, so much confusion. We have green onions, scallions, spring onions, Mexican onions. So let's look this up up a little let's look at this a little bit so these are scallions or green onions so a scallion is designed to only grow this much and it's not going to bulb uh, a green onion is an immature onion that they picked before it could bulb but they taste the same i can't taste the difference they're very mild and they have this part has like a green taste it's so good these are Mexican onions or spring onions. And you can see that basically these are just immature onions that were going to be big onions. And now they're not. These are really good for grilling. So, and then of course you have the yellow onion, which is a little bit sweeter than the white onion. And the red onion is going to be the sweetest of all of those until you get into um, specific sweet varieties like the Vidalia and the uh, Maui Maui onion. So I think that's Walla Walla and Maui onion, sorry. Okay, so today we're gonna look at making salsa, corn tortillas, rice, beans, carnitas, and flan for one or two, depending on how much you eat. The beans and the carnitas are going to take the longest to cook. So remember those beans that you soaked last night? You soaked them last night, right? So these are my beans that I soaked last night. And you're gonna drain them. I already sorted them and rinsed them. We're just going to dump them in our bowl. We're going to put some onions in there. It's about a quarter of a cup of onions and then a clove of garlic and a bay leaf. So then some people like to put a pepper in there and they put a whole pepper in there. Uh, that might be a little bit spicy. So remember how I showed you how to kind of take the seeds and the ribs off all in one. I left one little rib on there and apparently one little seed. We'll go ahead and put that in there. And then we are going to cover it with water. And then you're going to bring these to a boil and for about, uh, about an hour. And you wanna check on them, you wanna make sure there's enough water in there at all times, otherwise they'll burn. Then we have our pork. 
And so I always use pork shoulder. That's my favorite piece. It has very flavorful fat in it and it's really, really good. And it's very inexpensive. And really, uh, in order to get the best out of um, a pork shoulder or Boston butt is you have to cook it for a long time. So typically that comes in a very large roast. So when you're making a smaller amount, you can get uh, country uh, spare ribs or country ribs that have the bone in them, or you can get the uh, blade pork chop. So these are the pieces that I got. Okay, I accidentally started cooking this one because I forgot that I wanted to show it to you first. So this one is from um, Whole Shoulder. I just cut off a piece of it uh, so that you can see how similar it is. And this one is a uh, country pork chop. So they're very, very similar. I prefer this one because I like this fat cap on there. So we just go ahead and put that in there. And this might be a little bit more than a pound but it makes really, really good leftovers and they taste different. So then we're gonna put some onion in there. And then these are the carrots. So now we're not sure. So I usually use three or four carrots for a big pot. So I'm gonna go ahead and use two carrots and I just break them in half. And then I take the root end of my onions because uh, I'm not gonna chop them up and put them in anything. I've used what I needed, but they still have good flavor in them and we're not going to eat that part. So this is a huge bay leaf. Usually I'd use one or two. And then in here I have some cumin and some coriander, some salt, some Mexican oregano, and we're just going to put all of that in there. And those recipes will be on, uh, you can get those at the website. And then you're just going to cover this with water. And you're also going to put a lid on this. I know where my lids are this time. And you're going to put this also on the stove. And the beans will take about an hour and a half and the uh, carnitas, you're going to cook them twice. So the first time we cook them for about an hour, hour and a half, bring it up to a boil, put the lid on it and let it simmer. So here's another thing that makes the beans really, really wonderful. This is a piece of salt pork, and it's just, you know, the regular piece of salt pork you can get anywhere. It's a pretty big chunk, uh, because this is a 12 ounce piece, because I buy it for our whole family. But again, this is where you can go to the meat counter and ask for a piece of salt uh, pork or salt cured pork, and just get a little piece. So this is about an ounce and a half, maybe two ounces. It makes the beans really, really good. You see that piece of fat? That makes it wonderful. So let's make some salsa. To start out with, you need really good ripe tomatoes. But the basic ingredients are just tomatoes, some sort of acid, chilies, onions, and cilantro. So, when you start with your tomatoes, these are Roma tomatoes. If you're buying store-bought tomatoes, a Roma tomato is going to be your best bet. These are also called paste tomatoes, so you have the fewest amount of seeds and uh, juice. So when you, uh, if you can get them at a farmer's market, you want something called a salsa tomato or a big mama or a little mama. Those are really red. Sometimes you can get the good vine ripened tomatoes that's a hit and miss. Sometimes they're just prettier than they are uh, flavorful. If push comes to shove, uh, cherry tomatoes are your friend. So they're a little on the juicy side, but they have a wonderful dip, deep, rich uh, tomatoey taste. And the skins are a little bit thicker, so you have to work a little bit harder at chopping them up. So then you have to decide what kind of chili you want. Do you want the Serrano chili, which is a little bit hotter? So this is what it looks like inside. You have tiny little seeds. And then you have the jalapeno pepper, which isn't quite as hot and it has a greener taste to it, which I personally really like. So you can make this less hot. Then we have lime. And so you have a choice between the Persian lime and the uh, key lime. And we talked about this earlier, the key lime is not going to be quite as acidic, but sometimes Persian limes can be bitter. 
So you are going to need to taste it and work on that. So we have our cilantro and I've cut up the uh, jalapeno really, really little and we have some garlic and we have our onions. Now remember, we're only making about a cup of salsa. So the other thing is a lot of people ask me, what's the difference between salsa and pico de gallo? Uh, they are used interchangeably. Salsa literally means sauce. So a salsa can be made in a little machine, if it just fell apart, and it can be raw tomatoes or cooked tomatoes. A pico de gallo is always going to be fresh. Think of pico de gallo as kind of like the show off salsa Everybody wants to be seen, so it's sort of a rougher chop. Uh, it's not as much work for cutting if you're making it, you know, for one person. But if you're making a lot, the machine is definitely going to be the way to go. But I would still stay with fresh tomatoes because I think they taste better. Another thought on tomatoes. If you have to choose between the right kind of tomato and a riper tomato, by all means, please go with the riper tomato. Go with the tomato that smells the best when you touch it and smell it. That's going to be the tomato that you're going to want to eat, right? Okay, so let's get started. We are going to core our tomato and we're going to cut it in half. And see how there's not too much seeds in there? And then, and thank goodness we're only doing salsa for one here all night okay so see how this is a nice rough chop dull knife apparently okay so then we're going to put in some jalapenos and we're going to put in the onions and the cilantro and if you don't love cilantro that's okay. We can't be friends, but that's okay if you don't like cilantro. You cannot substitute cilantro with regular parsley though because your salsa will be bitter. It, it's not the same. So I put a lot of cilantro in there because I like cilantro. We're going to take our garlic and we're going to smash that in there like that. And it's however much garlic you want in it. Now, I promised you a way that we're going, I'm going to show you how to do this um, jalapeno without having to rib it by hand. So this is how you get it. You, you kind of cut it like you're going to do an onion. And you sort of just go around and turn it and keep sawing it. And what you're doing is you're de-ribbing and de-seeding all at the same time. And now you have a little jalapeno core. That's cool. That's hot. That's going to be a really hot part of the pepper. So then you just take this and you face it down and you slice it into these little tiny strips. And then after you do that, you just chop it like so. And that's how I got all those tiny little pieces. The serrano, you're going to have to dig in there with your fingers. I'm not into doing that right now. So then we're going to put the acid in. We're going to use this Persian lime. There's our acid. And then just so I can show you, <laughs> this is so little. So then you're going to stick that little lime in there. That little key lime had a lot of juice in there. So now, we're going to stir this up. And this is where you can get kind of creative. So we can put uh, some basil in here. Scoop everything over here. And you just sort of roll it up. Put that in there. You're just going to mix this up. And then you're going to add salt and pepper to taste how you like it. I have a little bit of Mexican oregano. So one of the things that's really neat, I'm not going to put all this in there. 
See all those little flowers? Mexican oregano is just different. Um, I can't tell you the exact reason why it's different other than I've noticed that Mexican oregano has little flowers in it. So you just keep mixing this up. And I know that's super chunky, but I hadn't, I forgot to cut tomatoes ahead of time. Okay, so now you have your salsa is ready to go. And if you want to put green onions in it, like the green part, uh, I think that's really tasty. Um, I know that there seems to be some concern about uh, using raw green onions, so that's entirely up to you. The other thing, if you just really want to go over the top with your salsa, is put in some chopped up avocado. So good. Cooking with Kimberly will return after this important message. RB Community Church loves its community and cares about those who don't have enough to eat every day. Teaming up with Interfaith Community Services, Friends and Family Community Connection, and Solutions for Change, RB Community Church is showing its love by sponsoring a food donation drive. It's easy to get involved. All you have to do is gather needed items from your pantry or store and bring them to the church's drive through drop-off collection service on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Saturdays in May from 9 to 11 a.m. Please be sure to place the donated items in your trunk, enter the upper parking lot, and follow the directions to the drop-off point. While you remain in your car, someone wearing gloves and a mask will unload the donated items from your trunk. Thank you for helping the RB Community Outreach Ministry continue to support our local families. Now, back to Cooking with Kimberly. Let's make some corn tortillas. The hardest part about making tortillas is just waiting for them to finish cooking. They are so good. Whether you make corn or flour, they are just wonderful. Today we're going to make corn because they're even easier. So. For corn tortillas, you need a bag of masa harina. And this is a bigger bag. There is a little bit smaller bag than this. But masa harina is the masa, which is the dough, which has already been made, which is a lot of work. It's a lot of work. Like, I don't even want to learn how to make it. It's so much work. And then they make the dough, and then they dehydrate the dough, and then they grind the dough back into little tiny pieces. And so then, it looks like this and it feels uh, like a super, super fine um, uh, cornmeal, but it's finer than that and, it, and they're, not, you, they're not interchangeable. So <clears throat> all we're going to do is rehydrate this. So we're going to take our salt. I use Himalayan salt. So with Himalayan salt, if you want to taste the salt, you need a little bit more, but it's worth it. It's really good. So then you put a little bit of salt in your, uh, in your dough. And then you take your water, and this is very warm water, and we're going to add six tablespoons all together, and I can't count and talk, and that's five. So then we just stir it all up. So you want to stir this, and I held back uh, a little bit of the water because you don't want it too sticky, just like our unleavened bread, right? So this looks pretty good. Now it's rehydrating. So you're going to want to give it a little bit of time to rehydrate, which is why the water is warm. And I'm gonna add a little bit more water. And I think that's pretty good. And uh, so corn tortillas aren't like, uh, corn flour isn't like wheat flour. So there's no gluten in here, which is great if you are gluten free, but it also means that you can touch it all you want and it's not going to get tough or weird or stringy or chewy. Okay, so we're just gonna let that sit for just a minute. And ultimately, if you're making a lot of tortillas, you might wanna let that sit for 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes to just really, really let it hydrate. We're making four tortillas, so it's not um, that important. So I did cut my perfect circles. <laughs> um, yeah, so the dough is really sticky and you don't reflour it or anything. So uh, you have to just kind of get it in the one shot. This is a tortilla press. And if you uh, are going to 
make tortillas regularly, which I think you might start, it's a $10 investment and it's fun. Look, you just put it down and you click it down. Okay, so you're going to need some little papers. Some people use plastic, some people use paper. I prefer parchment paper. So let's see how these are doing. This looks pretty good. So now you're going to squish this all together and you're making a dough ball. Ah. It seems easy when nobody's watching you. Okay, so one of the secrets is if you make your ball, now that's one tortilla and there's another tortilla, and you pat it and it sticks to your hand, it's still too sticky and you need to add a little bit more uh, masa harina flour, corn flour. So we're good. So we're gonna put this in here. I'm gonna put that one here, just kind of squish on there. And then if you like thinner tortillas, you're gonna put another one on top and another piece of paper. And you're gonna put this right on there. Push it down a little bit. And then you just push it down. Give it a second to stretch out. And now you have these cute little tortillas. And <laughs> so they weren't quite centered, so you have this little imprint, and that's okay. So you put those here, you divide this in half. Okay, the other thing you need to know about the masa harina, I mean the corn uh, tortilla dough and the flour tortilla dough as well, is it dries out pretty quickly, especially when you have a family. So just going to stick that on there. Right. Flatten these out. Okay, so as you can see, uh, I'm having a heck of a time. So as you can see, these have these little ridges in them, which isn't what we want. So now you take your piece of paper. You put it back on there and you can just roll this flat however you want to do it. Um, <clears throat> so now your tortilla is all the same uh, thickness, but it's <laughs> my tortilla isn't very round. So that's, that's how you would do this and you're always going to have to have uh, two pieces of paper or plastic or something because otherwise, now see that guy broke. So we're not going to cook him. So you're always going to need to have two pieces of paper or two pieces of plastic or something that uh, keeps them from sticking together because it is really sticky. And remember I was telling you about this drying out? This is drying out. So, it is so dry that I can actually get away with rolling it without the plastic. So then, do you remember our trusty pizza pan from Unleavened Bread? Well, we're going to go back and use that again. So we're going to turn this on to medium high. Then, what you want to do is it's called the 10 second style. And you want to have the, you want to flip it in the first 10 seconds that it's on there. So then you just let these cook for about a minute per side. And they're going to get little brown spots, but you don't want any black spots. Okay, so now we have tortillas and salsa. So today we're talking about cooking meals for one. And cooking meals for one is a lifestyle. And you have to shop differently because uh, everything comes in, in larger portions. So earlier I had talked about the deli counter being your friend. And I wanted to take a minute and really go back and revisit that for you. So uh, maybe you don't eat sour cream all the time, right? You just want a little bit. So I bought this uh, at, the, at the, I think I went to El Super uh, over by the 78. I know that they have all of this stuff at the, uh, 
at the at the deli counter. So this I just bought two ounces of sour cream just to show you that I could do it. And I bought these little pieces of cheese. And these are a lot of cheese altogether. But this is uh, these two are are fresh Mexican cheeses, and this is the cojita. I think is how you say it. I probably say it wrong. But this one is very very firm, and uh, they don't melt. They're not melty cheeses. These two are briny and salty and very very soft and this one you know you just you sort of grate it on your beans or your rice or whatever you want it on this is a Oaxacan cheese and it's the Mexican version of string cheese and it melts wonderfully but it doesn't last a very long time so you only want to buy a small amount so you can just buy two ounces if that's all you want the other thing I wanted to mention is tomato paste in a tube this is a big tube, but you can buy smaller tubes. But once you open a can of tomato paste, you're stuck. You're on the hook for that whole, I think it's two or four ounces. So this, you can just use as much as you want, and it lasts a really long time because there's no oxidation. Also, when it says uh, chicken broth, add chicken broth. Okay, yeah, I make my own chicken broth. And in another episode, I'll show you how to do that very, very easily. But in the meantime, and again, I know this is bigger than what you're normally going to buy, but this lasts a long, long time. And this is a low sodium. This one happens to be organic, reduced sodium, better than bouillon. And this is a chicken uh, bouillon base, and you just use a teaspoon at a time. And it keeps a really long time in the refrigerator, and you can make exactly the amount of chicken broth that you need. And you don't have to find a use for the rest of the carton or the can. Uh, a cheat that you have to be careful with that's very, very clever. Uh, this one is ginger. Uh, it comes in a tube. And they also have garlic. You're right, they're not as fresh. Uh, they're a little pricey. I think it's like 3 or $4 for each one. Um, you are going to have to use it in a certain amount of time. But if peeling an entire clove of garlic, so you, I mean a bulb of garlic so you can get one little clove, it's just a hassle, this is perfect for you. Then later I'm going to talk about this, um, I don't really know how to say it, but it's by Noor and they just call it tomate, I think. Anyway, somebody introduced it to me a long time ago and it is a combination of chicken bouillon and it's basically tomato uh, flavored chicken bouillon and you can see, and it's not hot or spicy, it is salty, it does have MSG in it. So um, I use it very sparingly. Sometimes I use it. Uh, it also comes in a really big can. So that's why this is a really good bet. So it gives you nice concentrated tomato flavor without having to uh, buy a whole can of tomato paste. So really quickly, I'm going to show you how to make the Mexican rice. One of the biggest secrets for Mexican rice is going to be the fact that you need to fry the rice. So I have some fat in here and it's nice and hot and you just pour your rice in there and you stir it all around. You can hear it sizzle a little bit. So you want it to all get coated with fat. Um, I used some of the fat that I skimmed off of our carnitas. And then you just let that <clears throat> brown and you want it to get really pretty and brown and so like right now you can see some of them are turning white. You need to make sure that you use a pot that's appropriate to the size, the amount of food that you're cooking. So if I did this in too big a pot, the rice is just going to burn. Okay, you can see the rice is just now starting to brown. And so this is when we add our onions. You want to stir that in there. Add the garlic. You've got to keep stirring once you add your garlic because you don't want it to burn. Your little bit of chili peppers, or you could use red bell peppers. A little bit of cumin. My cilantro, get that all in there. And this is really, really hot. And then I'm gonna put my tomato paste from my tube in there. You only need just a little bit, like a teaspoon. And you can see it's really getting nice and brown in there. And 
now, while it's all really nice and hot, I'm going to put my crushed tomatoes. These were whole canned tomatoes. And then I just put them in a blender, and that's four ounces, a half a cup. So you want to have as, twice as much liquid as you have rice. So then I have my chicken bouillon in there, which, you know, you don't need to dissolve it because it's going to get all mixed up in there. And then you bring it back to a boil and you put your lid on it and you let it cook for 15 to 20 minutes. I wanted to make a drink that can be served either with alcohol or without alcohol. Uh, so I finally decided to make a ginger mojito. So what we're going to do is you need a nice sturdy glass. Don't use a fragile glass. And you need about 10 to 15 mint leaves. So this was I think 10 mint leaves and then I used all the little itty bitty ones because they're so cute and you want to muddle those. This is my muddler and you just basically you're just smashing them up and then you're going to take some limes and what kind of limes am I using? Yes, I'm using the key limes and I had to pull out some of those seeds and you can see some of those seeds are pretty big. They're, they're big. So we're just... Uh, you're just going to smash them in here. And then this is the ginger. I just bought a little tiny ginger. And then here's a neat little tip for ginger. You can just uh, peel your ginger with a spoon. You just go like this and it just comes right off. And just goes everywhere all over your counter. So you shoot over the sink. Then it's hard to cut because it's very, very far fibrous. It's very, very fibrous. So I put it in a little Ziploc bag and I stick it in the freezer and then it gets really soft and pliable and okay, maybe it's not quite as fresh, but it's way easier for me to cut and honestly, sometimes that's what's most important to me. I left my sugar over here. So then you're going to add a little bit of sugar, about a tablespoon of sugar into this mojito. You're just gonna keep muddling everything together and then here's my ginger that I cut up See how it just, it's just so easy to cut, I'll show you. So then you're gonna muddle that in here as well. So we're gonna cut up our ginger and I just julienned it into little pieces like that. And then you just cut it like that. Then I'm afraid if I make the pieces any smaller than that, that I'm going to be drinking them. And that isn't exactly what I wanted to do. Anyway. So you muddle this all in like that, and then, and if you buy your soda water in a can, in a whole set of cans, then you can just open them as you go, and you don't have to worry about the whole bottle going flat, because it used to be that you could only buy them uh, in two liter bottles. So then you just muddle this a little bit more. I need to get some ice. So then you finish with this, with the rest of your soda water. And if you want, you can squeeze some more lime in there. off our ginger and then mix it up and give it a taste. I that is so good. Ginger and lime and mint that is a really really nice refreshing flavor and you could probably use a flavored soda water if you wanted to give it another level. If you would like to you can put some rum in here. I think a white rum would be really good. And it's not going to add uh, very much sweetness to it. And if you want to go top notch, you could put a silver Patron in there. It'll stay clear and it'll be really, really nice and very smooth. I hope you enjoy your drinks. I don't know about you, but I really, really like flan. Most recipes use sweetened condensed milk. That's a lot of flan. That's a lot of sweetened condensed milk. So. 
I use this recipe to make smaller batches. This is as small a batch as I can make. So uh, you're going to use an egg, a whole egg, and an egg yolk. Remember that one egg yolk? I can't get it any smaller than that. So you use three tablespoons of sugar. You're going to put that in three quarters of a cup of half and half. And then I always, when I need an egg yolk and a whole egg, I always try and get the yolk first. And that way, if I mess it up, I have another chance. So we're going to try and get this egg yolk out of here. And we have success. So now we just take this one and break it on in there. And now that's going to be our flan. And so we're going to mix that all up. We're going to add a little bit of vanilla. This is just plain vanilla. And you're going to add about a quarter of a teaspoon. And I lost my whisk. So you're just going to go ahead. Oh, it smells so good with that vanilla in here. And then the uh, egg yolk helps, the extra egg yolk helps with the uh, making up for the the sweetened condensed milk because they took so much of the liquid out, right? But they also put a lot of sugar in it. So you have a lot more control over how sweet you're going to want it. Uh, you could use all cream. You could use, uh, I don't know if I would do it with just whole milk. Yeah, I don't know. I've never made it that low fat before. I think half and half is as low as I've ever gone. Okay, and that just takes a minute. You just want to make sure that your sugar dissolves. And then you're just going to go ahead and pour that into your sugar, caramel sugar lined uh, ramekins that um, you, know, you melt the sugar and put it in the ramekins. Okay, so we've made our flan, I guess, batter. And then you're just going to go ahead and pour it into these little ramekins, which we put the, uh, the caramelized sugar into. So we're just, whoops, we're going to balance that. And so you can eat them both if you want. And these are little four ounce ramekins. And we made one cup of batter. And so when you make the sugar caramel, this is, uh, it's, it is really, really hot and it cools. Uh, once it decides to cool, it cools. So you can see that it's cracked. Uh, but you just put the sugar in the pan and you put it on a medium, medium high heat and you just kind of shuffle your sugar around and then, then you leave it alone. And it'll start to caramelize and turn this really pretty golden color. But it will go from golden color to burn really, really quickly. So now we're just going to take this over to the oven, I mean to the stove. So you're going to cook this on the stove top and because it's so nice and small, a really good convenient size. You can just cook it for 12 to 15 minutes right there on the stove in our little, um, now it's like a steam bath, right? And so then remember that meat that we cooked? So we have this beautiful meat and it took, uh, it took about an hour and a half, uh, almost two hours. And you see the onions in here, and here's our very tender meat. And so I have, um, I have uh, an aluminum lined pan, and I just uh, gonna take the meat out. You have to find it all. Take it out, and you're going to put it on the pan. And then we're going to cook it at 425 or 450 degrees, uh, just until it's nice and crispy. It's all the way cooked already, so all you're really doing is crisping up the fat. And then if you wanted, you could put the carrots on there. Um, so then we're just going to put this. Now, I, for small things, use my toaster oven. So I'm just going to put that in there for 10 or 15 minutes. And then remember our beans, and we put that little piece of salt pork in there. So here are our beans, all nice. These beans, uh, you know, they came out really light. I don't know why, but pinto beans sometimes come out a little bit darker, and this happens to be a lighter one. 
Here's my pepper that I put in there and that garlic clove. Our garlic clove is in there so you can retrieve it if you want and take it out. And you can see the pieces of onion. And then here's our beautiful piece of salt pork. And then we have our rice. Get this out of the way, sorry. Ta-da! Look at that, isn't that beautiful? Nice and fluffy and tomatoey. It smells so good. And uh, so anyway, that might be enough for two meals, but uh, I just cannot cut the uh, recipe any smaller than that. Okay, so the flan was in it, our little makeshift steamer for 12 minutes, and it's nice and done, and, and flan is still jiggly. If it's not jiggly like that, then you've overcooked it, and then it's not good at all. You know, uh, because we did a little steam bath, um, there's a little bit of water on the collection. You just take some paper towels and dry that off. And then here is our pork that we just took out of the oven. Look at all that beautiful color you have on there. And it's nice and crispy. And then you can just pull it apart like this. It's all nice and juicy still inside. And, uh, but nice and crispy on the outside. You can even cook it longer if you like that. The next day, if you want it again, you can fry it in the, oh, it's so good. So then we have our rice and we have our beans and we have our flan. I think that uh, we should make a plate. So I get my tortillas. Oh, and don't cook your tortillas for too long. You're going to have crackers and then you have a different kind of unleavened bread. So grab some of this uh, meat on here and make a little street taco. Put some rice on here and I'm going to put some beans. Go ahead and grab that chili pepper and apparently the garlic too. And put some salsa on there. Isn't that beautiful? All that salsa. Look at that bright coloring. I'm going to put some of this fresh cheese on here. See, this is how it just crumbles. Beautiful, and then this is the fresh cheese. It's not a very melty cheese. Add a little bit more cilantro because I can. And I think we should sit down and eat. So now you see, cooking for one can be fun. I hope you enjoyed your time with me.